So what we've been looking at is the alkylation of, of enolates. And in the last lecture, we looked at uh, what we need to do to alkylate uh, esters and what we need to do to alkylate carboxylic acids. And then I introduced you to this idea of the, the aldehyde problem. And that was the fact that aldehydes themselves, if we wanted to generate an enolate in order for us to alkylate at that position and form, in other words, form a new carbon carbon bond at this position, the problem was, and this is very important, the problem was that when you generate that enolate, this aldehyde is so reactive that as you generate the enolate, it will react with another molecule of this in solution. And we get a cross condensation occurring. And we're going to learn a little bit more about how that happens when you deal with the, the aldol reaction itself. Uh, so for now, we need to just accept that we have a problem when we want to alkylate. We cannot just use a base in order to deprotonate there um, and then add an electrophile so that we can alkylate at this position. So one of the solutions was uh, to form enamines. Uh, and we did that in the last lecture. And we saw that enamines can work, but they've got a big problem. Uh, say a problem, we've got a limitation, should I say, in that it only reacts with very reactive electrophiles, uh, allyl, um, allyl, allyl halides, benzyl halides, and then lastly the alpha halo uh, carbonyl type compounds. Um, so they are good, but the problem is, is they're very limited in their scope in terms of getting something on there. Uh, today I'm going to deal with the uh, a far more useful one in terms of its uh, applicability, and that's the azoenolate. And we already looked at that in a previous lecture, what an azoenolate is. Uh, and <clears throat> essentially, it is the nitrogen equivalent of an enolate. All right, azo is another word for, for nitrogen. And so what we do is that we first generate uh, an, an, an imine, and so uh, let's just take a, a simple example uh, of an aldehyde that looks like this. Uh, and we generate an imine of that. So if we're going to generate an imine, we need to be using a primary amine. Uh, and uh, uh, just following an example from your, your textbook, we can use cyclohexyl amine. Okay, that's a primary amine. And of course, if we're generating an imine, we need to have a catalytic amount of acid uh, present. Uh, and so we generate the imine, and it looks like uh, this. So here we have an imine is effectively the nitrogen equivalent of the aldehyde. And so in exactly the same way as we can deprotonate here, but we know that's going to cause problems, we can deprotonate at this point over here. Uh, the reason that we don't have problems here is that when we deprotonate is that this center here is not, uh, not uh, as not as electrophilic. Uh, in fact, it's very, very poorly electrophilic. Uh, and uh, uh, this center over here, we actually need to use a fairly strong base to, to deprotonate. Uh, and of course, our go-to base, LDA, is a very good option for this. But your alkyl lithiums, like uh, butyl lithium, is also very good. And also, we can use Grignard reagents. So R, M, G, X, bromine, chlorine, whatever, normally bromine. Uh, and so these are bases that are appropriate for, for deprotonating at that position over there. Uh, so what happens? Uh, we add a, a strong base, uh, and in this case, let's add LDA. Uh, we had one equivalent of, of LDA, and as you should know, we're doing this at a low temperature, um, and the solvent that we'll use will be THF. So we let that stir around for a while, and we deprotonate, uh, and you should be able to do the mechanism of, of this, of course, and we will get this azoenolated, the nitrogen equivalent, so minus charge there, uh, and then we'll just put the cyclohexane ring uh, back in. So now we've got this nitrogen equivalent of that, and now we can add whatever alkylating agent that we would like, just standard alkylating agents, provided they are primary and secondary leaving groups, not tertiary. Remember, tertiary ones will not react um, with enolase. And so, uh, yeah, in, in the textbook, they uh, use this example. It's a protected aldehyde, in fact, the bromine on it over there. And so, mechanistically, go like that. Sorry. 
Um, <clears throat> we go like that, and the product that we form is now the alkylated version of, of that. So make sure that you're counting all your carbons. Don't lose things uh, as you go along, or lose carbons as you go along, because it's very easy to, uh, to do that. This is the position that we added on to. There's that uh, carbon, uh, carbon there, and so we have those like that. All right, and so this will be our product, which when we hydrolyze that, all right, when we add um, water, we can go back to the to the aldehyde and we get um, this over here. Let's draw this slightly differently. Okay, so watch what we did here. Overall, um, in order to alkylate this aldehyde at this position over there, we had to go via this azoenolate, right, generate the azoenolate, and then add the electrophile. Notice that these are discrete steps. This is step number one, and then this is step number two. Okay? This is a very good way of being able to uh, uh, alkylate aldehydes without having the problem of cross-condensation. Okay, So we have enamines. Nice because they're mild. We don't have to use special bases or anything like that. So that's using a secondary amine to form an enamine. But limited because we can only alkylate with uh, the uh, the allyl uh, halides, the benzyl halides, and uh, alpha ha halo compounds. So an X over there and some R. All right. So they're very limited to just those uh, electrophiles. Uh, whereas the AZ enolate, we can use any electrophile except, of course, a tertiary uh, um, electrophile, uh, uh, leaving group on a tertiary carbon, that we can't use. And that's the next important thing that I want to talk about now. So this is now our second and uh, very critical principle that we need to cover in this lecture, and that is you, how we're going to use tertiary alkyl halides uh, as, as electrophiles. Um, I've already said to you that we can't use them in standard enolate chemistry because they're not good SN2 type electrophiles, but we are able to use them uh, in a special way with silyl enol ethers, which actually ends up being uh, a solution also to the aldehyde problem. Um, but this principle is with ketones as well as with, uh, with aldehydes. So if I just take a, a, a simple aldehyde, just a random one, propanol, uh, and we generate the silyl enol ether, remember you should know how to do this. So OTMS is over here. That's the silyl enol ether. And we do this by reacting it all in one part, TMS chloride, uh, with triethylamine as the base, uh, and we can do this in dichloromethane, and this is all done at room temperature, uh, and we'll generate this silyl enol ether. Now, what we said with the silyl enol ethers is that they are very poor nucleophiles. All right, uh, what we're wanting to do is we want this center over here to act as a nucleophile. This is the, the enol equivalent. We're wanting lone pairs of electrons to kick in like that, and they can do this. All right, they can kick in and attack something like that. But the problem is, it's very, very weakly nucleophilic. And so in order for this to happen, we need to add an incredibly powerful electrophile. Uh, and one example of an incredibly powerful electrophile would be a carbocation. A carbocation um, if you can generate a carbocation, you can get the silyl enol ether to attack that, and it'll form a new bond there. And this is the and the product would look uh, like this: O T M S positive, and we formed a new bond now to the tertiary center over there. All right, so there's our new bond that was that was formed uh, via the silyl enol ether. And remember, I said the T M S is is one way of thinking about TMS is to think of it just as being like a, a type of a proton. Um, and at this stage over, over here, this is very ready to, uh, to fall off and to go onto the solvent in, in workup or uh, something else. Uh, what I want to just uh, consider though is that it's all very well saying we want to add a tertiary carbocation. The question is, how do we generate a tertiary carbocation? Well, we generate tertiary carbocations from 
the tertiary alkyl halide, such as having a chlorine there. The hard part, though, is that we need to pull this chlorine off. We need to add something that whips that uh, and chlorine off to generate the carbocation. And the way that we do it is we need to add a Lewis acid, a very strong and powerful Lewis acid. Uh, and there are a whole host of them that would actually work in this. Uh, and just as an example here, we could use something like titanium uh, chloride, and that would, also, that would pull off this uh, chlorine over there, and we would generate the, the carbocation. Notice, of course, what we've done is we've pulled off a chlorine. So at this point, we've got a chlorine. So there's actually a Cl minus um, effectively lying around, and that in this reaction can pick up the TMS uh, group actually in the end generating uh, TMS chloride which is of course what we added right in uh, the beginning uh, over there and then of course the, the the product aldehyde so this is a very powerful go and make sure you read this up in your textbook and make sure you understand this is an incredibly powerful method for doing these types of reactions where we have a tertiary center which you can't do under normal inlaid conditions uh, and we can use saline this it's also a solution to the the aldehyde problem that we have that we can form TMS ethers of aldehydes but this works equally well and is in fact used a lot um, with with ketones.